Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to be with you here. Uh, my name is Amol Sinha, and I'm the Executive Director of the ACLU of New Jersey. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to Raising the Bar, Civil Rights, the New Jersey Supreme Court, and the ACLU. As the last week of U.S. Supreme Court decisions has shown us, litigating cases under state constitutions in state Supreme Courts may be more important than ever as tools to protect, promote, and expand rights. New Jersey state constitution takes an expansive view of civil rights and liberties, and our state Supreme Court has a well-deserved reputation for decisions that confront cutting edge legal issues, profoundly impacting the lives of New Jerseyans and reverberating throughout the nation. At the ACLU, our New Jersey Supreme Court docket has grown substantially over the years. And in the past decade, we've invested in growing our presence before the court, developing our amicus practice, which you'll hear more about, and training new lawyers to be effective appellate advocates. We strategically select cases on key issue areas, often working with advocates, law firms, community members, and other partners in our common pursuit of justice. Now, during today's program, you'll hear from some of the foremost litigators in the state who either work for or partner with the ACLU in those consequential cases that our, that our high court is known for. These leaders are actively working to take on novel issues and working to change the face of who traditionally argues before the court. I often tell anyone who will listen that the ACLU of New Jersey has one of the most effective and efficient civil rights litigation practices in the country. And that's in large part due to the lawyers that you'll hear from today and the cases that our Supreme Court decides to hear. Before we get started with today's program, I wanted to take a minute to thank our sponsors without whom this event would not be possible. A huge thank you, first of all, to our lead sponsor, uh, Lowenstein Sandler, who's also serving as our CLE provider for the event. Thank you so much, Lowenstein. I also want to thank uh, Gibbons PC, Chiesa Shahinian and Gian Tomasi, and Paul Weiss for their sponsorships. Thank you also to McCarter in English and Pashmanstein Walter Hayden for their partnership. And thank you to all of our, all of our sponsors at every level. Our work would not be possible without you. A big shout out also to our wonderful partners and friends at NJPAC, the Performing Arts Center, uh, who are the ones who are producing today's great event. And with that, it's a great honor to introduce you to the individual who is responsible for leading the litigation work of the ACLU of New Jersey, my friend and colleague, ACLU NJ's legal director, Jean LeCicero. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you, Amol. I, I'm so excited to be with you and hear from our speakers today. And I have the honor of introducing retired New Jersey Supreme Court Justice, Janie Lavecchia, uh, who to many of you on this webinar needs no introduction. This afternoon, Justice Lavecchia will be sharing her perspective on judicial independence, which is a particular, particularly timely topic given the breakdown by the legislative and executive branches in ensuring that New Jersey's judiciary is fully staffed. Justice Lavecchia retired from, the New Jersey, from New Jersey's highest court in December after more than 20 years on the bench and a previous distinguished career in government service. She is the longest serving woman on the court and the third longest serving justice overall in the court's history. During her tenure, Justice Lavecchia authored more than 300 opinions, including some powerful dissents, and shaped the jurisprudence of some of the most significant issues in New Jersey. Her opinions have addressed key civil rights issues like the scope of anti-discrimination laws, police practices and accountability, and government transparency. Prior to her nomination to the court in 2000, her leadership positions included serving as deputy chief counsel to Governor Thomas Kane, chief administrative law judge in the Office of Administrative Law, and director of the Division of Law in the Department of Law and Public Safety. As a fellow alum of the same schools, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that she is also a graduate of Douglas College and of Rutgers Law School of Law in Newark. And she served as a role model to many of us who came after her. So thank you, Justice Slovakia, for taking time to speak with us this afternoon. 
Jean, thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's a pleasure to be introduced by a fellow alum. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be able to talk to you today about the subject of civil rights, the New Jersey Supreme Court, and the ACLU's work in front of the court in that area. After recently concluding my almost 22 years on the Supreme Court of New Jersey, I appreciate the opportunity to make some comments about the court that I was so proud to have served on during that time. The court's independent spirit and the work that the ACLU does as participants in the many civil rights matters that came before the court during my two plus decades. But before I talk about the Supreme Court, let me begin with a few comments about the elephant in the room. Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. The US Supreme Court issued its decision Friday with a majority, five members of the court, holding that Roe v. Wade and Casey were overruled. A sixth vote by the Chief Justice upheld the Mississippi statute that was being challenged, but didn't go that far. Three members jointly authored a bracing dissent. And lest we not forget, there were two separate concurring opinions by Thomas and Kavanaugh. My comments about this begin in the form of a question. And trust me, this will eventually lead me back to the original topic I expected to speak on today, the New Jersey Supreme Court judicial independence and the forms in which that independence manifests itself. But back to Dobbs for just a little bit. We all know that courts generally, and that includes SCOTUS, rely on credibility and persuasiveness for their opinions to be accepted and their place in our democratic society to remain intact. I fear both pillars have been seriously damaged by what happened Friday and perhaps by other of the decisions emanating at the close of this term. Does Justice Alito, who wrote for the majority, expect all of us, the public, to accept, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the US Constitution and the rule of law demand that's what he said, demand was his verb. That a person's civil rights in this setting, a woman's right to choose to have an abortion, which the majority describes as one of the most important questions roiling our democracy today, be determined by individual persuasion and majority voting in the states. According to the majority, our ordered liberty sets limits and defines boundaries between competing interests. Okay. But they say Roe misstated history and Casey declined to reconsider Roe's faulty historical analysis about a woman's right under the constitution to choose to have an abortion. It didn't exist, he said in 1868. According to the majority, the balancing of interests struck by Roe and Casey is one that is not properly rooted in the constitution and it's not for the courts to set. Rather voters, in individual states may view the balancing between the interests of a woman who wants to choose to have an abortion and the interests in potential life differently. And states must be permitted to make that decision through the political processes of persuasion and voting. Justice Kavanaugh says that's just the normal process of courts acting neutrally, not tipping the balance in favor of or against either side in that balancing of interests. And Justice Thomas is certain, certain that there is no substantive due process right or rights to be found in the Constitution and recommends revisiting all cases on which such rights have been recognized. Or when we're talking about civil rights, individual rights, do the dissenters have the better points on these very personal matters believed in this instance for 50 years to have been of fundamental value. The dissenters make several important points that I thought we lived by. One, when it comes to rights, the court does not act neutrally when it leaves everything up to the states. Rather, the courts act neutrally when it protects the right against all comers. And you can tell I'm taking liberally from the dissenter's language without attribution. So forgive me for not putting quotes around all of the things I'll be saying about that. 
but they do add a right is not at the mercy, not at the people's mercy. The point of a right is to shield individual actions and decisions from the vicissitudes of political controversy, to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials, protected by the establishment of legal principles to be applied by courts, that is the court's role. The dissenters, second point is they disagree with the majority's dissection of the validity of Roe and Casey. I'll leave that to you to review on your own because I'm moving to the third point, which fits with my remarks. They go farther and address starry decisis and the injury they perceive to the rule of law visited by the majority's action. It can't be, they say, that a bare majority viewing a decision as egregiously wrong is reason enough to discard any precedent with which it disagrees. Now, without mentioning all aspects of their reasoning, the dissenter's opinion bears attention for its discussion of reliance of a right being taken away for the first time and what removing this right, in this instance, the right of a woman to choose, does to women as well as to people, all people, contemplating the prospect of the court for the first time removing from individuals a right that had been considered fundamental here for 50 years. For women, the right to choose situates a woman in a relationship to others and to government. It defines a sphere of freedom, they say, and the capacity to make decisions free of government control. And losing it presents an immense loss of power, control, and dignity, as the dissent points out. And to get to my final and transitional point here, the dissenters emphasize the role that constitutional liberties, civil rights play in our structure of government. The rescinding of an individual right and concur conferring it on the state affects everyone who has relied on our constitutional system of government and its structure of individual liberties protected from state oversight. They cite Casey's own language and say that the public should never conclude that a change in membership of the court adhering to a different doctrinal view could simply because of numbers alone expunge people's rights in such fashion. The Dobbs decision is, and here I have to say words do fail me, uh, but I'm going to use the Chief Justice word, his word from his confirmation hearing and in his discussions about precedent. It's a jolt to the system of constitutional adjudication and the role that precedent plays. It is deeply distressing on many levels, not the least of which is its revelation into the interactions of Dobbs majority with the other members of the court and the public. And we will live with an alteration of those perceptions about the court for some time into the future as we learn more about it. But as for abortion rights in New Jersey, we know that abortion rights and questions about personal integrity have received separate and enhanced protection by the New Jersey Supreme Court's jurisprudence. The right has been and may continue to be examined separately under the protections provided by the New, New Jersey Constitution and its provisions respecting individual liberties. For decades, our court has been unafraid to exercise independence of thought as demonstrated in a more expansive view of individual rights under our constitution. So allow me to turn back to my original subject to the extent one can stop thinking about Dobbs and other recent opinions issuing from the court at the close of its term. My subject today is the New Jersey Supreme Court. And I won't be critiquing recent important cases because the panelists that will be following me are more than able to highlight decisions of particular importance. And in part also it's because I confess that there are no one or two cases that were the most important to me although I, I was heavily invested in that state v. Andrews case. And I appreciated the ACLUs being among those organizations that tried to get SCOTUS to review that issue, which I felt was of national importance. And if I was really being honest, 
there are a number I could mention that gave me moments of great satisfaction. But as a whole, what has made me proud of the time I had on the court is the thought and the steadfast belief that the court maintained its independence throughout that time, notwithstanding some seeming efforts to influence the court and tr the tremendous amount of turnover experienced by the court in its makeup during that time period. I remarked in a longer speech that I, I gave at Rutgers Law School last fall uh, about that. And, and I will be drawing from some of those comments about the importance of judicial independence in all of its facets and how that continued to be demonstrated over the first two decades of our court during this past century, notwithstanding those aspects that I just mentioned. In the early 2000s, when I first joined the court and the last members of the Wolens court were retiring, the court was solidifying even as additional changes of great importance continued. Chief Justice Ports and Chief Justice Azali retired mid that first decade and um, more people changed during those first years of that initial decade. But it was a court whose members were anticipating each other's thoughts while doing what all good thoughts do, listening to the views of one another. At that time, it was beyond my expectation that any colleague of mine performing competently and during good behavior would not move through the reappointment process in due course. But the end of that decade, that didn't happen for a very dear and well-respected colleague of mine. At the time, there was no reason based on competence. There were only murmurs and some writings and political aspects that the act was intended as a signal of dissatisfaction with decisions emanating from the court. When that happened, it struck me how different that was from the respect shown to the independence of the court by Governor Kane when he renominated Chief Justice Wallens for reappointment as Chief Justice. In a memoir that he wrote later, he explained he viewed that act as demonstrative gubernatorial support for the very notion of judicial independence. Now, judicial independence is thought about in many ways. We know that it's important and essential for the public to accept decisions issued by the judiciary because they view them as free from extraneous influences of bias, prejudices, personal preferences, it's necessary to support that public acceptance. And it's usually thought about when there are the big interbranch disputes, when people look to see how the court is going to react. It's easy to think of those as the typical demonstrations of a court that's independent. And our court certainly had those experiences many times. Before my decades on the court, we had the Robinson v. Cahill cases that started in the 70s and continued in the 80s and 90s. And they continued into the 2000s. Um, the Abbott v. Burke decisions, the last two of which I was privileged to write for the court, showed that this was not a shrinking violet court. The court followed through on that line of case law, ultimately agreeing that the state could try uh, a new statutory formula, provided it was fully funded but the state reneged. And when it did, the next year, the court acted as it should and ordered the restoration of full funding under the formula that it had agreed to allow the state to implement in lieu of the judicial orders that controlled funding to the Abbott districts before. And then there were the affordable housing stare downs concerning the Council on Affordable Housing. The court had to act to keep it uh, faith with the Mount Laurel line of cases. And it did so in a series of cases brought in rather short order that restored a workaround to prevent having statewide affordable, affordable housing efforts be delayed or even stymied by at first a recalcitrant and then defunct state agency. But there's so much more to judicial independence beyond those dramatic interbranch conflicts. It shows itself continuously through independence of thought. And that is my key notion to 
to provide to you today. On a regular basis, those aspects of judicial independence complement the more dramatic moments. I can give you three examples. And the first one you know all so well because it's in the area of constitutional adjudication and the development of civil rights. I use as an example, our demonstration of search and seizure law and the New Jersey constitution to provide greater rights than that which is provided under the fourth amendment, even though the two provisions language is virtually identical. Historically, and over the past two decades, our court continued the tradition started in State v. Johnson, which was a consent to search case, by providing greater search and seizure protection under Article 1, Paragraph 7 of our Constitution than that which was being decided as provided under the Fourth Amendment. And that led through the years to cases that again and again provided greater protection of individual rights in search and seizure settings. State v. Hunt, State v. Malika, and others preceded my time on the court. But during those last two decades, the first two of the 2000s, there were many more. State v. McAllister, State v. Reed, and State v. Earls continued that same tradition. The last for me was Carter, the license plate issue and whether or not our court would recognize a reasonable mistake in law as being uh, providing reasonable and articulable suspicion to support a stop and search. The US Supreme Court had said yes, we said no. It's a fine tradition by our court. Structuring our search and seizure line of pro enhanced protection using our constitution and it's one that the ACLU has had a strong, strong role in developing. Our court has not been shy to consider arguments based on either Article 1, Paragraph 7 or Article 1, Paragraph 1 based on the individual rights provisions. All I can say to you is keep up your attentiveness in this area. It's critical, not only for areas under development, but also for maintaining advances already accomplished as we just witnessed on the federal level. In New Jersey, I use as a cautionary tale, State versus Hempley, case that received, uh, was received with skepticism and some criticism when it was first issued. But over time, I believe has come to be seen as the correct and appropriate standard to be applied here in New Jersey. I urge you to keep it safe. I hope that our court never experiences what we are watching unfold at the national level. May we never see a change in the guard be a reason to revisit and reject a decision that some people in certain areas might continue to view as unwarranted and overly protective. But I do think it would be shocking to most people in New Jersey now to have their curbside trash vulnerable to warrantless searches by law enforcement. There are two other areas that I just mentioned by example as ways in which our court's independence of thought it reflects the judicial independence that the members of the court bring to their work. One is our exercise in our superintendent's power over how proceedings are conducted in the courts. We have that power and we've used it sometimes in modest ways, such as when the Ferriera conferences were created to implement the Affidavit of Merit statute, but at the same time, take steps to ensure that it didn't become a trap for the unwary. At other times, we used it for much more significant matters, State versus Henderson, and its creation of a new path to be followed in eyewitness identification was premised on the use of that power. And similarly, in State versus Andahar, that's another important example of the court taking novel action to recognize implicit bias in jury selection during the jury selection process and calling for steps to curb it. Those were novel, creative, and appropriate uses of that power that our court was not afraid to exercise as necessary.
And last but not least, there's of course the state's superintendents over the common law's development. That stewardship is so very important. Prior to my coming on the court, the court had a wonderful tradition of adding to the common law in significant ways as it developed. Henningsen versus Bloomfield Motors, Kelly versus Gwinnell, Hopkins versus Fox and Laszlo, three entirely different areas, product safety, social host liability, and premises liability. But in each, the court stretched to allow the common law to develop recognizing as appropriate new duties while protecting and promoting interests as they were revealed by evolving societal needs and public policy. During my time, premises liability was expanded with Olivo versus Owens, Illinois, and Schwartz v. Accuratus, which recognized the need to protect people in a household when asbestos was brought home on workers' homes workers' clothes and those garments were handled by other members of the household. And we saw social host liability expand in Justice Albin's opinion, a state of Narleski versus Gomes. So it now addresses liability that arises when an underage adult invites people into his parents' home, allows them to drink to a state of visible intoxication, knowing they'll get in a car and they do result in injury to third persons. It's perhaps the common law that the court's independence of thought and creativity is most important to remain steadfast. The common law doesn't have to wait for the legislature to act. It can't become calcified because it is supposed to reflect evolving policy. But all those areas that I've just mentioned show how judicial independence is essential not just for public acceptance of decisions, but it's essential to the substantive progress in our legal landscape. It fosters the environment for independently thinking judges. And that positive externality was for me among the most proud aspects of my time on the court. We had so many different people serve on the court with me during my time, 21 different people, the most of anybody in the, in the time of the modern court people of all different backgrounds, prosecutors, criminal defense attorneys, plaintiff's attorneys, um, civil defense attorneys, people from government in the federal, level, federal sphere as well as the state sphere, and that all of us came together again and again to promote and protect the independence of the court and to remain creative and open-minded to the issues that were brought before it notwithstanding uh, efforts to maybe hope that the court would take on a more hobbled role as a result of the ongoing changes in personnel. It didn't happen. We did not have a court that altered its confident and independent course. Judicial independence is precarious though. I have to warn you, it ultimately depends on individuals, it depends on how gubernatorial as well as advice and consent power is exercised. It's never going to be enough for belief in an independent judiciary to endure among members of the court and the judiciary. It requires, requires the continued consent of our elected officials. And it most certainly though, depends on the fortitude of individual judges and justices. Our court faced political maelstroms during my time and it was sturdy. My hope is that it will cherish that and continue its fine tradition of being open-minded, innovative, and independent in thought, which to me is the hallmark of judicial independence. I, my time in the court has finished. My journey is over. The, oars, the work of the court will be picked up by others, but it's so important that they and you, the advocates before it, keep up the good work and promote the arguments that need to be advanced to keep the law advancing. I want to thank the ACLU in particular for always advocating so well and for informing us of your concerns, of listening at oral argument, which is a hard thing to do when you're an advocate, and for engaging in real true dialogue with the court that proved itself again and again to be meaningfully educational and helpful in the difficult matters that we had to decide. I thank you for your efforts 
and I urge you to continue your very, very good work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justice Lavecchia, um, for your wonderful remarks. And I'm so grateful that you took the time to discuss Dobbs um, because not for the first time in the past few days, I was very moved by them. And it's a really important reminder for, uh, for us to not take the concept of judicial independence for granted because it's so foundational to a functioning democracy and for building trust in our legal system. And thank you for highlighting how it's critical to protecting judicial independence is critical to protecting individual and civil rights and developing a common law to protect New Jerseyans. So as we get started with our panel, uh, I wanted to just give you all some context for why we organized this event and how the ACLU of New Jersey's appellate practice has grown over the last several years. Um, but first, we are going to, again, thank our sponsors for this event, and we'll be showing slides for just a couple of seconds to recognize their support. Thank you, Andrea, for doing that. And, um, and so we're back. And uh, let me just give you some context about our work, which is that the for decades, the ACLU of New Jersey has regularly appeared as a friend of the court, um, also known as amicus, at the New Jersey Supreme Court, uh, where we file briefs and argue in cases brought by other parties. Uh, and, and when I say regularly, I mean that for most of the organization's history, we were in a, a couple of cases uh, a year at, at most. Um, and about 12 years ago, there was a, a turning point for us, which is the court rules for participating as amicus changed so that the New Jersey Supreme Court's docket and process were made more transparent, which allowed the ACLU and other potential amici to plan better. Um, and then this rule change coincided with the growth in our organization and in our, in, in, our, uh, in our legal department. <laughs> and the result is that we've been able to really build an amicus practice at the court and uh, also at the appellate division uh, where the ACLU of New Jersey is appearing in dozens of cases every year addressing civil rights and civil liberties implications of, of those decisions. And last year, for example, the ACLU of New Jersey appeared in a third of the cases granted certification at the Supreme Court. And so when the court agrees to hear a case, we make strategic decisions about how best to support an outcome that respects individual rights and equity and access to the courts. And so when issues are arise impacting particular communities, we reach out to community partners and coalition members to join us in those efforts. Depending on the issues presented, our lawyers develop objectives on the goals of our briefs. And so we consider what information would be most useful to the court. This can be providing relevant jurisprudence, presenting legislative history, compiling social science research, conducting data analysis, documenting stories or identifying potential impacts of a that a ruling might have in, in the communities we work with. And so you'll get to see a slice of that work today when you hear from the panelists and you'll hear about a case where we've been representing a petitioner directly for nearly a decade. And with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Catherine Weiss. Catherine is a partner at Lowenstein Sandler and chair of the Lowenstein Center for Public Interest. She has an extensive career in public interest law, including 14 years at the National ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project. So Catherine, thank you again for agreeing to moder uh, for moderating today's discussion and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jean. And thanks to everyone for being here. I'm gonna start with the most exciting part of the event, which is the CLE code for this, this panel. So there'll be two codes. I'm gonna read one now and one at the end. And they are, the first one is 871052. Again, 871052. Okay, so that's the first CLE code. And before we get started, I just wanna say, you know, I wanna thank Justice Lavecchia again and say that she's such an exemplar of the ways in which character influences um, judicial independence. 
And you know, one of the things that's true about the Dobbs decision is that it 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 seeks cover under the language of judicial restraint. Um, and the the majority opinion acts as if it is a restrained thing to overrule a constitutional right and leave this issue to the legislatures. And it ignores in in so many ways that that character will influence. Um, the character of the judges will influence their understanding of the case and the kind of empathy and integrity and humility and collegiality and intelligence that the New Jersey Supreme Court has evidenced over many years is, is really what, what makes it independent and valuable as a separate protector of our rights. And so I just thank Justice Lavecchia for being an exemplar of those qualities because without them, we, we, we can't hope for the kinds of outcomes we deserve. All right, so on to the panel. Our panel includes several of the lawyers who've argued the key civil rights cases in the New Jersey Supreme Court term, and I am going to introduce them. CJ Griffin is a partner at Pashman Stein and the director of the Justice Gary S. Stein Public Interest Center, named of course for one of our great Supreme Court justices. Larry Lusberg is a partner at Gibbons and the longtime director of the firm's John J. Gibbons Fellowship in Public Interest and Constitutional Law, named, of course, for a great federal judge. Alex Shalom is the senior supervising attorney and director of Supreme Court Advocacy at the ACLU of New Jersey. And Karen Thompson is a senior staff attorney at the ACLU of New Jersey. And we're going to head right into the New Jersey Supreme Court term. During this term, the court issued landmark, case, landmark cases in two key areas, police transparency and criminal justice. And we're gonna start with police transparency. So the ACLU of New Jersey has long focused on working toward greater police accountability and transparency. Shortly after George Floyd was murdered, the New Jersey Attorney General issued a directive to require every police department in the state to publish the names of police officers who were subject to major disciplinary actions. Several police unions immediately sued to stop the disclosures. And can someone talk about the ACLU of New Jersey's response to that, that lawsuit? I'll get us started, Catherine, thank you. Um, so these, this, these two directives came out and they, the, the first one said that going forward, we're gonna publish kind of summaries of major discipline, including naming the officer who was subject to that major discipline. And the second one was a, a backward looking, a retrospective look and said, we'll go back 20 years, at least in the state police and in, in some other state controlled departments to disclose the people who had been subject to that discipline. We at the ACLU thought these were useful steps forward but incremental, they were not what we were hoping for in, in the sense that we wanted more, uh, we wanted more backward looking, we wanted more substance. We didn't just want major discipline because major discipline meant you could find out if officer Jones had been suspended, but if officer Smith had done the same thing and hadn't gotten disciplined, you'd never get that information. And our work we've done around the state around internal affairs taught us that we weren't going to get enough information about police misconduct based on the sliver we were getting, but it was better than what we had. And so we, we were supportive of the directives as far as they went. And we certainly thought it was within the power of the attorney general to, to issue the directives. So we got together. And when I say we, I mean the ACLU and our community partners and our legal partners, people like Larry and like CJ, to say, how can we support here? And, and what we settled on, and CJ will talk more about this, but what we settled on was doing three different briefs. The ACLU wrote a brief on behalf of 30 odd uh, civil rights organizations talking about the right, how important it is to get this information, to learn about police misconduct, even though it didn't go far enough that it was within the attorney general's uh, jurisdiction. But CJ, maybe you could talk a little bit about how we kind of divvied up uh, who, who was going to do what and, and why we thought divvying up was so important. Yeah, I think our approach here was hopefully helpful to the court. 
all of us have been involved in police transparency issues for many years, and we all wanted to weigh in on this decision. But I think what would have been less helpful for the court would to be to receive several briefs that basically all said the same thing. And so we talked about the different voices that the court should hear from. And so we sort of identified, of course, there's the ACLU type perspective, which is about civil rights and racial justice. Then there's uh, the criminal defense bar, which is the group that Larry represented and, and his organization spoke about why individual criminal defendants needed access to uh, information about police misconduct. And then I represented two organizations that were actually law enforcement organizations comprised of prosecutors and police officers who actually support transparency and believe that it's good um, for police officers and for law enforcement in general. And I, for my clients, we felt that was a very important perspective because the adversary in this case, trying to keep these disclosures from taking place were police unions. And so the, the procedural posture of the case was very much officers against transparency and an, an attorney general who wanted transparency by giving another voice to the court, we, we were able to talk about the ways in which transparency benefits police officers too, in addition to the ACLU groups and uh, the criminal defense groups. So CJ, beyond the attorney general's directives, which, you know, spoiler alert, were upheld, um, the Supreme Court itself has expanded police transparency in New Jersey. Can you tell me about other recent decisions that expand access to records about police misconduct? Yes. So this term, there have been a couple um, decisions. They were collectively issued uh, about a week apart. Uh, but I will say, you know, I've been litigating public records issues for almost a decade now. And the first thing I noticed almost a decade ago was that police were incredibly um, opaque uh, and secretive. Like you could not access hardly any records about anything having to do with transparency. So over the years, I personally have litigated about a hundred police transparency cases. And in any of those cases that made it to an appellate level, the ACLU of New Jersey has been there supporting my me and my client as amicus. And so that, you know, we've helped, we've litigated to make body cams and dash cams and use of force reports and standard operating procedures public. And then the next step was police internal affairs and disciplinary records. When we say internal affairs records, I just want people to know that's internal affairs is the process by which police investigate claims of misconduct um, themselves. So someone will file a complaint with the police department, whether it's a, a fellow officer, a superior, or a member of the public. And then there's this unit within the police department that investigates it. It's all confidential and secret. Um, and then they make a recommendation. And then from there, some superior decides whether or not to follow the recommendation for, for discipline. Historically, all of that has been completely shrouded in secrecy. And the only information that the public would get would be a list of the types of discipline that were imposed without an officer name. And then after this directive came in place, an officer name was attached to it, but everything else was completely shrouded in secrecy. And the problem with the attorney general's directive was that we didn't get any access to the actual records. What we were getting was a statement that would say officer Jones was suspended for five days for violating sick leave, or maybe they wouldn't be that detailed. Maybe they just say violating a rule and regulation. And so I identified long ago that my goal, and, and which the ACLU shared, was to try to crack open internal affairs records. And that leads us to the Supreme Court's recent decision in Rivera versus Union County Prosecutor's Office that came out in March. Um, in 2019, someone who was a complainant leaked to the press the fact that the Union County Prosecutor's Office had sustained the complaints that the police director, James Cosgrove, of the City of Elizabeth Police Department had used racist and misogynistic language in the workplace. Through reporting and sources, the press was able to ascertain that what he actually said was the N-word and the C-word and all sorts of other things. Um, we, my client, uh, who is actually uh, a former law enforcement officer, um, 
in a police practices expert, we filed a request for the internal affairs report because one thing we've learned is even when the police tell us some things about what's happened, there's often many more things that they didn't tell us and disclose. And so we wanted to see what does the actual report say? How long did this go on? What is, who else knew about it? Uh, and that sort of thing. The agency denied access to it. We went to court. Uh, long story short, it ended up before the New, G New Jersey Supreme Court to decide whether or not the internal affairs report would be subject to our Open Public Records Act, which is the statute that gives us access to public records, or pursuant to this other area of law called the common law, which is developed case law. Um, and so the court ultimately held that it wasn't subject to the Open Public Records Act. Um, that was not a decision that was a surprise to us based on the fact that the Attorney General's directive says that these records are strictly confidential. But I think in an exercise of judicial independence, um, and I'll note with the support of the Attorney General whose policy makes them confidential, um, the, the Supreme Court issued this landmark ruling that for the first time opens internal affairs records to the public. And so what they did was the common law right of access considers the interest, again, interest against disclosure and contrast it to the interest for disclosure. The previous common law balancing test though, the list of factors only considered all the reasons why something couldn't be disclosed. And then there was this generic statement that you balance it against the requester's interest. What the court said is we need some factors for courts to consider on the other side of the balance. And so they provided those factors to say, it, you know, where, uh, where certain other factors are present, there is a strong transparency interest and the records should generally be disclosed. And so what they said is you would look at the nature of the misconduct that's in the, in the reports, such as whether it was excessive or deadly force or discrimination or violence or domestic or sexual violence or fraudulent, uh, fraudulent concealment or fabrication of evidence or records or other abuses of public trust. You'd look at whether it was substantiated, whether discipline was imposed, whether it was a high level official, whether there was a record of misconduct, and all of those factors can lead to disclosure of internal affairs reports. And in this case, they said, this is someone that was in the highest echelon of the department. His behavior had the ability to affect the de department as a whole, and releasing these reports will no doubt foster public the public's trust and say so that in this particular case the report has been ordered to be released unfortunately it has not been released yet <laughs> but but we're, we'll, we will get it um and so you know it this case bolsters the attorney general directives because the dir the directive gave us the names in a description now we can use those disclosures to try to get access to the actual reports to see whether or not the directives are actually accurate and we're finding that they're not the disclosures that were made pursuant to the directives and the second case i'll just very briefly talk about it is a case about an, a separation agreement uh, that a county corrections officer entered into with a county and the the agency told us that they did that they terminated the officer for misconduct separate documents that we obtained elsewhere actually said the agency let the officer retire in good standing with a pension um, and that he admitted to inappropriate sexual conduct with two incarcerated women. And so those were two drastically different uh, versions of events. And the Supreme Court said that we were able, were able to get a redacted version of the settlement agreement. And they stressed the importance of getting access to actual records so that we can fact check the government. And so that's why we have public records laws in the first place, that we don't have to just trust what the government tells us. So this is some of the work that ACLU has done. In both of these cases, ACLU supported us as uh, amicus, friends of the court. Um, and then ACLU is continuing to push this issue further. And uh, there'll be a link in the chat box uh, soon where you can submit a form, a petition to the legislature and ask them to support ACLU's police platform, uh, which includes uh, two bills, S-371 and A-996, which would make 
these records statutorily accessible to the public and give us even more access to internal affairs records and also support things like civilian complaint review boards and ending qualified immunity. So I hope everyone will just quickly fill that form out and, uh, because transparency is so important. Thanks, CJ. So obviously transparency can advance police accountability and we're gonna turn now to some of the criminal justice cases from the last term which were also in the end about respond, responding to police misconduct. So Karen, in the Carter and Roman Rosado cases, weren't they about public safety and making sure that license plates can be read by police officers? And, and it, isn't that a goal that the public can support and that the ACLU can also support? Well, obviously we support public safety as a general um, idea, but I think what Roman Rosado and Carter showed us is that there are ways in which law enforcement can misuse the question of public safety um, to transform it into a surveillance tool that is abused and specifically abused in communities of color. So the issue in Carter and Roman Rosado um, there are twin cases, two separate cases with slightly different facts, but both uh, surrounded the question of whether or not license plate frames can in, in impose any kind of obstruction on a license plate. And uh, there is a statute that says there can be no obstruction, but basically what the Supreme Court found is that that was simply just too vague. There is no kind of logical reason for having a tiny, tiny bit of Garden State or a tiny, tiny bit of New Jersey, which was readable, um, but just very partially obstructed to be the basis for a traffic stop by officers. Um, and so you heard uh, Justice Levecchia earlier talk about the fact that the court ruled on the question of whether or not that was a reasonable mistake of law. That is whether a police officer is allowed to make a mistake about a stop, say, based on an obstruction of the uh, license plate frame or, or not. And the federal, uh, the federal opinions, the Supreme Court of the United States said, hey, it's okay if cops make those sort, sorts of mistakes. But the uh, New Jersey Supreme Court said that that's actually not acceptable because when you start making those mistakes and when you start kind of abusing this broad, broad um, uh, statutory frame, then people are going to be hurt for it. And, and just as a statute, excuse me, a statistical question, um, between 2017 and 2021, over half a million summonses were issued based on license plate violations, right? Just that frame, like, again, you can read Garden State, you can read New Jersey, but based on the, the fact that these cars had frames, half a million people were stopped. And the most summonses, summonses were written in 2019 with over 100,000 issued. So this was affecting a huge number of New Jerseyans. And the court said, that's just simply not enough. It is not a legitimate reason to stop cars. Um, and, and what this is really about is ending unnecessary touches, touches between the citizenry and police who are looking for kind of vague violations or non-public safety involved violations uh, to pull someone over and to justify those stops and turn it into something bigger. Because when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And so um, I, I pass this to Alex now because I think that kind of central core question that we were in, engaged with, with Roman Rosado and Carter, um, the larger implications, the kind of bigger racial implications, the abusive misconduct implications um, came out in, in the Naima case. Before we go to Naima, Karen, can you just say, uh, you know, the court was looking at a statute, right, in Carter and Roman Rosado. Uh, what did they say? Can the police ever stop you because of a license plate obstruction? Yeah, that was a great point. <laughs> Thank you. It's important. Uh, absolutely. If you cannot read the license plate, right, because that's the point of the license plate is to provide information. Um, it's to uh, identify the owner or the user of the, the vehicle. Um, it's used now, as we all know, to charge tolls. Like they're very important reasons why a license plate needs to be read. 
but if there is nothing that is preventing that license plate to be read, then you can't um, create the stop. You can't then create this bigger um, problem. You're kind of in manufacturing a problem that isn't a problem. And so the court said, keep it to what you're supposed to be doing, which is finding visibility and um, identifying people who might be engaged in public safety violations. Okay, yeah. So Alex, you know, racial profiling has been prohibited in New Jersey for a long time, but in Myers and Naima, you argue that the police were profiling and what did they do and how is it profiling and, and you know, what did the court think? Thanks. Yeah. Let me, let me pull from what Karen was just talking about. When, when Karen first decided to take on the, the Roman Rosado case and told me that kind of shocking figure about the number of people who got stopped, I thought, wow, that's crazy. And, and I went outside and I looked at my cars and both of them had dealer license plates, right? It said whatever Toyota on it, and it covered a little bit of it. I've been driving with those same license plate covers for a decade and I've never gotten stopped. And so it's not just the volume of people who are stopped, but it's that it, not every New Jerseyan was being impacted equally. And I think Naima shows us a little more about how that happens. And so in Myers and Naima, they were co-defendants in the case. Um, there was a robbery at a 7-Eleven in Hamilton. And the, the description that went out over the radio was very limited. It was simply two black men left on foot. That's all that they knew. And it goes out over the radio and it comes to an officer who's on the other side of Hamilton and he starts driving towards the 7-Eleven. The 7-Eleven is right in a major highway interchange. It's right near 195. There's a lot going on. You can get on the turnpike really near there. Um, and as he's coming close or to the, uh, to the 7-Eleven, he sees a car go by and he shines his light in it. And there's a, 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 a white guy and a white woman in the car and they uh, kind of, put up their hands in alarm. They don't like having the light shown in their face and he lets them go. And then there's another car that comes by and they're reasonably close. They're like less, they're about a mile maybe from the 7-Eleven and it's some time afterwards. We don't know exactly how long, it's reasonably close in time. And the, there are three black men in this car and they don't respond to the light. They don't put up their hands. They just keep looking straight ahead. The officer uh, stopped the car and he gave three reasons for the stop. Reason one was, well, they were close to the 7-Eleven. But I've already said, right, maybe about a mile. I mean, there are literally could be thousands of people within that range. He said he thought it was suspicious that they didn't react to the light. It was unclear to us whether it would be equally suspicious to react to the light. But the third one was that they matched the description that had been given. And so just to be clear, the description that had been given was two black men. This was three black men. And so it left us to wonder, does this mean that any number of black people could be stopped, right? Because the, the police response to the discrepancy was, well, there could have been a getaway driver. It's true, there could have been. They also could have split up and gotten into separate cars, or one could have gotten into a car and one onto a motorcycle, or they could have gotten into a bus. There, there's like any permutation. And it was clear that this officer thought that he was entitled to stop any black motorist in New Jersey. And the thing that made the case hard for us was this officer guessed right. As it turned out, Myers and Naima seemingly were involved in the robbery. There was some contraband found in the car later on that was tied to the robbery. And so what we didn't want the court to grapple with was we knew we wanted to talk about how harmful racial profiling was, how prevalent and how harmful it was. But what we didn't want them to focus on was, but, but they got it right. So we thought, well, when do, when do we know they get it wrong? And we wound up writing a brief, not on behalf of the ACLU, but instead on behalf of 66 Black ministers and other clergy people who had provided spiritual guidance to victims of racial profiling. Because we knew that the court only sees cases when they find contraband. But what happens so much more often with these touches that Karen was talking about, these touches between police and civilians, is that someone is stopped, they're harassed, they're humiliated, they're disrespected, and then they're let to go on their way. And they wind up seeking solace in, in faith leaders and in others. 
But the court shouldn't just be focusing on when contraband is found, but also on the practices that lead to all these touches that lead to the humiliations. And of course, the humiliations and the indignities also sometimes lead to tragic results that we've seen time and time again around the country. And so uh, that's why we said it was racial profiling, because we thought it was nothing more than a vague racial description that frankly would apply to hundreds of thousands of New Jerseyans, and that that shouldn't form a basis uh, to justify a car stop. And the court agreed. And if I can just pop in, because I uh, this morning, actually, the Supreme Court issued another opinion in a case called State v. Smith, that was around tinted windows, right? So in New Jersey, there's statutory provision that allows um, people to have tinted windows in their back, uh, their rear view, um, their rear view window. And um, that's not, it was unclear whether these tinted windows are allowed in other places on the car. And a police officer stopped a car um, seeing that there's a tinted window in the back. So. Uh, right out of the bat, there's nothing illegal with that, but the, the officer stopped the car and then proceeded um, to search the car. Well, well, they saw the person through the windows, by the way, through the tinted window, um, moving something. And so they decided that that was enough to search the car, which they did, and they found a gun. But what the Supreme Court held in State v. Smith is that is just simply not sufficient reason to have a stop based on tinted windows and that um, tinted windows everywhere else has to be limited. That the idea that you, have to you can stop on a tinted window has to be narrowed to something that is like that justifies the reasonableness the, uh, that creates articulable suspicion for the stop. And that the, the Supreme Court said requires not being able to see into the, into the car. Now this seems very logical. This seems very basic but it wasn't basic. What it was, was as we have already spoken about another tool to justify this kind of profiling, this kind of stop. And so this is another uh, tool that the Supreme Court said is not acceptable. It is not statutorily um, justifiable and that has now been pulled from use. So good day. Catherine, can I say something about uh, racial profiling on the roads of New Jersey? You know, all these young lawyers here don't, and even you, you said it's illegal in New Jersey. So in the 1990s, we began this fight. Um, and I was involved in a number of racial profiling cases in the 1990s. And one of the first cases I argued on this issue in the Supreme Court, very along the lines that Karen was just discussing about the tools that are available, was a case where I represented the ACLU of New Jersey back in the day when, as Jean said, they were only were taking about two cases a year. It was a case called State v. Cardi, in which the court said that uh, uh, that um, troopers could not even ask for consent to search cars that they stopped along the turnpike unless they initially had some articulable suspicion that there was wrongdoing. This is, to this day, um, a tremendous expansion of Fourth Amendment rights under the New Jersey Constitution, exactly what Justice Levecchio was talking about, that doesn't exist, certainly not under our federal constitution and not in a lot of other states either. Um, but I just want to point out that um, from for decades now, uh, the ACLU of New Jersey has been active in, in fighting racial profiling and the advocates like the ones that people are hearing from today um, have been extraordinary warriors in that fight building up tool after tool to address it. Um, but it's been a long time coming and let's be clear, um, the work is not done. Yeah, thanks, Larry. I, I actually remember the 1990s driving while black campaign it was right out of the ACLU national office and, yep. and affiliates yep. as well mm -hmm. to try to address this problem of traffic stops being so wildly disproportionately aimed at, at people of color, in particular on the New Jersey Turnpike. Mm -hmm. The turnpike data were horrendous. All right, so on to jury selection. In Andahar, the Supreme Court announced that it would be holding a judicial conference on jury selection to improve the selection process in New Jersey. The conference was held last November, and in April, the committee, the conference committee, released various recommendations for improving the jury selection process. Um, I, you know, the recommendations included a bunch of, of things that were aimed at, at 
lowering systemic barriers to participation in juries and addressing various forms of bias. Was the creation of that conference the most important outcome of Andahar, Karen, and, and why? Um, well, first of all, I, I also just want to very loudly <laughs> shout out the Office of the Public Defender because we usually, we obviously we're coming into cases of amicus, but there are organizations and groups and individuals who have seen these cases kind of um, from their from their beginning, who have worked with people individually, um, and and their work is what we can come in on. We kind of come into the slipstream to support it, and so uh, Joseph Russo, who worked on this case, Maggie McLean, who worked on the Smith case, it's always um, masterclass in uh, fighting for these things, and so I just want to appreciate them as we start this conversation. Um, obviously, there are things that are fantastic about Anduhar, and, and one of them is, is that that judicial conference was held. Jury participation is one of the most important forms of civil engagement that we have as American citizens, and it is a fundamental way to participate in the de democratic process. And in Anduhar, a Black man from Newark, uh, who was known as FG, um, was arrested, excluded from jury service, and all of this done without cause for trying to participate in this exercise of democracy. So the Judicial Conference on Jury Selection was held, and the issues that you mentioned, uh, Catherine, were discussed there. Great thinking was done. We now have commentary. Um, but most importantly, the court recognized in the decision that unconscious bias, unconscious racial bias as a form um, well, is a form of illegal discrimination. And as uh, Justice Chief Justice Rabner put it, uh, implicit bias, and I, I'll quote from him here, is, is no less real and no less problematic than intentional bias. From the standpoint of the state constitution, it makes little sense to condemn one form of racial discrimination yet permit another. And so those two things, recognizing implicit bias as a form of racial discrimination under the constitution as an unconstitutional act um, that is just as important as intentional bias, that is profound. Um, and secondly, that this conference was held to address the ways that jury selection generally is a problem, huge things. However, um, where I struggle both with the opinion and as an attorney of color, as a female attorney is, is in the question of how arbitrary the law is when it comes to the humanity of people of color and how intrinsically human rights are deemed as something to be given and not some things, not things that are in, inherently held, right? And so for me, what was very troubling about this decision was that um, one, the court said that bias wasn't unconscious, right? That that it was, the bias was, was implicit, not explicit. And I, I, I struggle with that because if you look at what the prosecutors said about FG, and, and I'm gonna quote a little bit of what they said. They said that given his background and his extensive, his extensive background in the criminal justice system with friends and family and knowing what the testimony in this case is going to be, I think the juror should be excused for cause. Now, his extensive background was that he had friends and he had family who had been arrested who had served time, right? He also had friends and family who were police officers that got dropped out of the conversation. But what the prosecutor said is because of these associations, FG could be dismissed for cause, which means that the prosecutor believed that his associations made him tantamount to not being able to follow court's instructions or their oaths, their, or jurors' oath. Another prosecutor who has worked who obviously was working on the case as well, said that what I think is very concerning is his close friends hustle and engage in criminal activity. That's how they make a living. That draws into question whether he respects the criminal justice system, whether he respects what his role is here, and whether he is going to uphold all the principles that he was instructed by your honor, right? So now, if you know people in the system, then you don't respect justice or the role of a juror, right? And so, I think that if you are depending on this level of stereotypes, you know perfectly how well how the stereotypes are functioning. 
you know exactly what you are trying to do, which is pathologize and criminalize people who know people who've been in the system. Now let's 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 contextualize all of this comment. In 2010, the Department of Justice found that Newark police were engaging in a pattern of unconstitutional conduct by disproportionately stopping, arresting, and using excessive force on Black people, stealing their property, and retaliating against anyone who questioned those actions. And the DOJ found that three quarters of police stops in New York were, were found to be unconstitutional. A Newark PD was put under a consent decree because of these abuses. Right. So when we even talk about what it means to be arrested in Newark, when we talk about what it means to be stopped, it is within the context of unbelievable amounts of misconduct. So the numbers are skewed. And of course, people who are growing up in Newark are going to know people. What this is essentially saying is that being placed in Newark, living there, having grown up there makes you unfit. And that for me is explicit. There's nothing implicit about that. And so that, that really bothers me. How can you center black people in a question of civic engagement when the prosecutor and later on the judge who works with her to have FG arrested in the courthouse and put in jail for 10 hours, how do black people become civic participants when this is what the state, this is what the law is doing, right? And so this is where I also wanna say that our work is, is, you know, if there's a mountain, if we're climbing up the mountain, you know, the ACLU, we come in in the middle, but our community partners, they started there. They were there from the beginning and they will be there after Anduhar to work with these communities, to work with the people who are influenced and touched and harmed by this sort of behavior. And so um, at, at Anduhar, the argument that I was trying to convey to the court is that people are at the center of this. We always come in with stats, as Jean said at the beginning, we in our brief say, look, this is what happens. These are the numbers. This is what happens here. This is how um, things are organized at harm. But what I wanted to say is those stats are all based on people and the harms that we're trying to undo start in courtrooms like this. And so, I understand um, and ap appreciate this acknowledgement of the bias. And I, I, I love that we now have a new way to think about this. What I do not love is that we can't name what is happening for what it is. And I, I do hope that as we continue to litigate, now that we have this open door, that we can start to center that unjustness. Yeah, I mean, does anybody else want to talk about Andohar? It's a really, really important decision for a whole lot of reasons. And and I think, you know, Karen, that perspective on it is also really important because, you know, it's like such a lawyer reaction to go, oh my God, they recognized that unconscious bias counts under the constitution. For those of you who may be listening and who have the great fortune of not being lawyers, you know, under the federal constitution, only intentional discrimination of the I hate you because you are not white variety is actionable, right? All of the, you know, thousands and thousands of other actions that occur outside that rubric are not actionable as discrimination. And it's so easy to sort of say, what a great thing that implicit bias is actionable under the constitution that you could easily lose track of your point, right? Which is who says this is implicit? And right? I also, the other thing that I think needs to, I, I keep missing kind of the bigger issues too, as well, some other issues too, is that, um, you know, we got kind of caught up in the question of peremptory challenges and how, you know, we, how do we use them? Are they being used in a discriminatory manner? But what happened here is that the prosecutor avoided using a peremptory by deciding that instead she was gonna use her police powers to run a criminal background check on FG and use that to disqualify him from service. So the safeguard that is in place is Batson, right? That you can make a Batson challenge that you can say um, this was racially motivated. But when the prosecutor, knowing again, full well what she's doing, sidesteps the, the safeguard, 
then peremptory challenges aren't even, they're not in the mix. Well, I, and mean, then this, I understand the facts of this case, the trial judge denied. They sought to disqualify FG, the prosecutor sought to disqualify FG on the ground that, you know, he knew a lot of people who were involved in the system. And the judge was like, that doesn't make FG biased. No, you may not use a peremptory challenge. And then they ran a criminal background check and had him arrested to get him off the jury. Right. If I understand the facts correctly. But she she asked to dismiss him for cause. So I, I you know, they, yeah. And it was so, not. Right. right. So instead of then using a peremptory. Right. She then, instead chooses to run a, a criminal background check. And exactly. she, what did she, she did find a municipal warrant that was seven years old that was then some dismissed. I also will add that she lied about FG beating women, right? So again, this is like, there's this like steady beat of criminalization, of, of association, of all of these things to pathologize FG. But again, we're talking about peremptories when that was never even it never became the center. It never became the thing that harmed him. So. I'd, I'd wanna say that I think what Karen just said was so powerful and something that I think ACLU and other amici have been bringing to the court, um, which is focusing on impact and harms of the decisions. I think as lawyers, especially white lawyers, it's easy to just focus on the law and the, and, and the precedent and all these legal arguments, but the court also needs to hear about the, the direct impact. Um, and so that I think that was present in this decision. I, th I think Karen's argument in uh, Carter Roman Rosado was also powerful in that regard and bringing, uh, talking about the, the harms and then also in Naima too, giving a voice to that. And I think that's, I think that's a different, something different than what's been done in the past, but it's something that's happening more frequently and that is powerful and important. All right, so in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to the Melvin Patton battle cases, which are, <laughs> which are also shocking examples of, um, uh, I mean, uh, of how we uh, treat criminal defendants. I mean, it's just, they're shocking examples. So in those cases, Alex, the court talks about acquitted conduct. And so first of all, what is that? And how is it related to sentencing, to criminal sentencing? Sure, so, so the idea behind acquitted conduct sentencing is that you get convicted of one thing, acquitted of the bigger thing, and then the judge has to decide how to sentence you for the thing that you got convicted of. And the question is, may she consider that for which you were acquitted, right? You were acquitted, which means the jury found that the state didn't prove you did it beyond a reasonable doubt. If the judge says, I find you did it by a preponderance of the evidence, may she nonetheless take that fact into consideration. And under federal law, in a case called United States v. Watts, the answer is yes, they can consider it. So let me just give you the facts of Melvin, because I think it, it, it kind of makes it pretty simple. Melvin was charged with a double murder and an aggravated assault, and he was acquitted of the murder, the other murder, the aggravated assault. He was acquitted of possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose, but he was convicted of unlawful possession of a weapon. The, the, the jury basically said, we don't think you shot the person, we don't think you shot the other people, but we think you had a gun. The judge at sentencing said, I'm sentencing you for the gun. The range based on Mr. Melvin's criminal history was five years to 20 years. And the judge said, I'm gonna give you at the top of the range because I think you use that gun to murder people. I think you use that gun to shoot people, notwithstanding what the jury did. I'm saying, I think I can still sentence you because the Watts decision says I can. And so this was a test of what Justice Lavecchia was talking about, going back to Hunt, going back to Hempoli. Does the New Jersey Constitution provide greater protection for New Jerseyans than the federal Constitution provides for Americans? And, and the answer, uh, both in the search and seizure context that she was talking about, and here in the, the kind of sentencing due process context is yes, 
and the device that they used is this doctrine of fundamental fairness. And fundamental fairness is like a gap filler. It says we have robust protections for due process in New Jersey, even though Article 1, Paragraph 1 of our state constitution doesn't use the word due process, our courts have consistently found a right to due process. And in the criminal context, even when a right hasn't been fully extended, if the result will be so unfair, so unjust, the court has sparingly, but importantly, used this doctrine of fundamental fairness to fill the gaps. And so in um, these companion cases, Padden Battle and Melvin, uh, in an opinion by Justice Pierre Louis, the court using the doctrine of fundamental fairness said that in New Jersey, acquitted conduct sentencing is forbidden. Once the jury speaks through an acquittal, that message is powerful and it can't be overridden by the judge becoming the 13th juror and saying, oh wait, no, hold on. I think he really did it in, in Mr. Melvin's case or she really did it in Ms. Patton Battle's case. And so it, look, the truth is it's not a practice that happened that often in New Jersey. There weren't, unlike the cases Karen was talking about, there weren't hundreds of thousands of people being subjected to acquitted conduct sentencing, but the spec, and it really was only happening in one courtroom in New Jersey, but the specter of it happening was changing calculations people were making about going to trial or pleading guilty. And, and it, it so undermines anyone's sense of fairness. Does it make sense that the jury said he, he didn't do it, yet the judge is going to sentence him based on that? Yeah, I have to say that this is one of those things that every time I am reminded that under federal law, a judge can say, true, the jury acquitted you. Me, I think you did it. And so I'm going to sentence you more harshly. That is so insane. It, I think if you, if, you, if you polled Americans and were like, if you're acquitted of a crime, can you still be sentenced based on the judge's conclusion that you did it? I think Americans would be like, of course not. Right? Well, That's well, insane. And, sure. and so it's, it's one of those things that I think, you, you know, and, and, and so interesting that the court that the court will calls it the doctrine of fundamental fairness, that the court is prepared to say, well, that's just nuts. That's so unfair that it cannot be constitutional, right? That there is that kind of backstop in, in New yeah. Jersey under our constitution. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, Larry, you had a great victory in, in the Comer Zarati cases. And I know that you and the ACLU represented, I think it was Comer, James Comer, right? For a decade or more. Um, the court in the Supreme Court in those decisions this year said that a minimum mandatory sentence of 30 years without parole for a murder conviction committed by a juvenile is unconstitutional. So why do they say that? And, and is it different from what the, fed, the federal court says? Um, thanks, Catherine. Um, so I really have to bridle at the, at the opening statement that I got a great victory. Um, this, was, this, this case is an example of great work by the ACLU. Um, the idea of bringing this sort of challenge um, was, if not Alex's, then um, Alex's predecessors, but certainly um, when we all started working on this about a decade ago, um, we saw a significant problem and, um, and had an opportunity to do something about it in New Jersey that went beyond what the federal law was. Let me just quickly trace that and I can do it really quickly. Um, through the early part of this century, the United States Supreme Court held first that the death penalty was not applicable to, to crimes committed by juveniles, and then that life without parole was in most cases not, um, could not be imposed on a, on a juvenile offender. Um, the question in Mr. Comer's case initially was what does that mean, life without parole? And we sought from the outset to extend the law. And this is a, just a great example of what the ACLU does. I mean, you've heard from, you know, from Amol and Jean and Karen and Alex today, and you see what brilliant advocates they are. One of the ways that they're brilliant and one of the great things that the ACLU does is not just seek to win cases because of injustices that are done, although, as you point out, with regard to the last set of cases, that the notion that you can be you know, sentenced for something that you committed um, 
that you were acquitted of is crazy. And so some of what they do is to address the craziness in our system. And I hate to tell you, but I think there's more of that coming. Um, but but, but a, a lot of it is trying to extend doctrine to places where it hasn't been before. And so what we tried to do in Comer was to extend this idea that life without parole was not appropriate for juveniles um, to sentences that were what we called de facto life without parole. Uh, Mr. Comer had been sentenced to 75 years, 68 without parole eligibility, and all of the statistics um, seem to indicate that the actuarial statistics seem to indicate that he was likely to die in jail. And so our argument was that that was the equivalent of life without parole. And the court agreed in the first Comer decision, which was called Zuber. And I should note that this is a case where the ACLU played two roles. We, Alex and I, um, represented, and, and a number of awesome people who worked with us, um, represented Mr. Comer directly. But at the same time, these cases, and there are two arguments in the Supreme Court, both times were paired with other cases where the ACLU participated as amicus. So it was awesome because uh, I got to argue for Mr. Comer and Alex got to argue for the amicus. And so we could double team the court, um, as I know Justice Levecchia appreciates when we do that. Um, so, um, so then the case goes back and the judge um, sentences Mr. Comer to 30 years without parole, reasoning that that was the minimum sentence for a murder. It was a murder case, although I should note, not a murder case in which our client pulled the trigger. It was a felony murder where there were a series of robberies of gas stations, and um, and there was a murder in the course of that, um, which which matters uh, analytically ultimately. But in any event, we then challenged the idea that thirty years without life with, with, without parole was also inappropriate. And our argument was that with regard to juveniles, there was a series of factors that had been laid out by the United States Supreme Court in a case called Miller versus Alabama that courts had to consider in sentencing juveniles. And if there was a mandatory sentence, even if it was a lengthy a mandatory sentence that wasn't light but still was long, like 30 years, then the full play of those factors could not be really considered, that it wasn't a sentencing based upon all the facts and circumstances. And so um, the, the court again reversed and said, no, um, really, and I should note that the court only did that after several years of waiting for the legislature to act, and the legislature did not act, and to this day the legislature has not acted, um, and that's really quite tragic because I think the court in the first Comer decision provided a real blueprint for what the legislature ought to do, which is to set a time when a juvenile offender can be considered for parole, not released, Sometimes they won't be eligible for release. Sometimes their crime will be too bad or their institutional record would not be worthy of release. Um, but, but they should at least have that opportunity because when a juvenile is sentenced as a juvenile, we really don't know what's gonna become of that person. Their brains are still developing. The science shows um, that they are very likely not to recidivate uh, once they've spent a certain number of years behind bars. Um, and so um, the court said, no, that full play has to be uh, allowed and, and said that a sentence of no, of, no more, of, of no more than 30 years without parole is appropriate, but a court could go down as low as 20 years before parole consideration. Um, in Mr. Comer's case, he was resentenced again, this time to 25 and a half years. Um, and while we were disappointed that it wasn't as low as it could have been because he's really an extraordinary guy who's um, done amazing things in prison, both in terms of music and religion and, and just rehabilitating himself. And by the way, he also has a tattoo of a picture of Alex on his chest, which is really quite something. Um, but this is one of the unknown you know, benefits of working for the ACLU folks. Um, the, um, you know, that, that, you know, we really thought he, he could get it immediately. But at the end of the day, he started with a 75 year sentence and he now has a 25 year sentence. And so it's an enormous victory, but it's also an, an, an enormous victory for him because as others have pointed out here today, there are real people involved here. And it's really gratifying to, to, to have a client like that who appreciates it so much and really, you know, this, this saves his life. I mean, at the end of the day, um, and the ACLU is to be thanked for that. Um, but, but also we move the law and I, and I think that's something that we can all feel really good about. Um, so, uh, it's been, you know, a, a long, difficult journey and it's just been one of the honors of my career, uh, to work on it with the ACLU, um, as so many cases have been. Thanks, Larry. Okay, we are out of time. And so we are not going to have time to talk about the last case, which is about compassionate release and which has not yet been decided but we are gonna have time to hear the last CLE code. 
So our how lucky is that, okay? The last CLE code is 243615. Again, 243615 is the last CLE code. And so you can all fill out your forms and we thank you so much for coming. And my thanks to the members of this amazing panel and to Jean and Amal and Justice Lavecchia and the whole ACLU of New Jersey, which, which you know, has done amazing things in the state and continues to do them. So thank you. And I think we're out. <laughs>